Your heart is 
Hello, my Kaku. All right, let's everybody get settled. We're going to start in about a minute. Mahalo. All right, so um, it's, it's pretty funny. I, I was walking through the crowd. It's beautiful, by the way, to see everybody here. I was walking through the crowd, and I was thinking, okay, we're going to introduce Auntie Ku. Um, and I was walking this way, and Uncle Ale is wearing a very, very bright yellow shirt, and he caught my eye. And I'm like, what better person to introduce Auntie Ku than Uncle Ale? So I'm going to have Uncle Ale come up here. Um, we say a few words and introduce Auntie Ku. Oh my kaku. Peoko. Hello my Obawana. Oh you mouth no mahalo nui. Mahalo. Mahalo. Hello my kaku. Obawana kala nele kakalao. Before I introduce our keynote speaker this morning, I thought I'd start off with a song. Nah, I I just joking. I'll save it for after lunch. Nah, I'm just joking. But um, it is my profound pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning for this awesome um, celebration. Observation, la kuokua. Um, there's been a lot of women who've made an impact in my life. Uh, definitely um, politically, I was uh, blessed to have Auntie Haunani K. Trask as one of my kumu at, um, at the University of Manoa. Um, but another woman that has made a major impact in my life is, of course, uh, Auntie Kuka Hakalao. Uh, um, <laughs> Pai Kalima. Pai Kalima. Pai Kalima. Been blessed to have her in my life uh, for the last 36 years, for sure. Um, she's made a profound change in not only my life, but many other people's lives as well. Um, uh, with no further ado, though, I think it's only um, uh, right that we just introduce our keynote speaker. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here today. This is a very important day for us, um, and we've got to make sure that it's perpetuated forever. For right now, I'd like to introduce our, um, our keynote speaker for this morning for our La Kuokua festivities for today, Anti Ku Kahakalao. I'll take that, definitely. Mahalo piha e kanoa. Mahalo. It's okay, yeah, kala kuokoa, yeah. Kala iwa kalua kumavalu o nove mapa. And we're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff, certainly the story of la kuokoa and about education with aloha which is air for short, and air meaning sovereignty and independence, because the whole purpose of education with Aloha is to work towards a sovereign and an independent Hawaii. As was mentioned, my name is Auntie Ku, and I'm going to start with my protocol, right? Like we started with protocol this morning, uh, out, uh, um, out there with the pico, some did their kahea as they came in, and I'm also gonna do my protocol before we get started with the story of today. Aloha Aloha na kua, Aloha na auma kua, Aloha na liio hawaii, Aloha na kupuna, Aloha na makua, Aloha kalehulehu, Aloha, Aloha my kako. I want to greet everybody who is here today from that smallest mo'o in the corner there to all of my students. Can you believe I had some? See Poki'i behind there in the 1980s. I had some like Auntie Malia in the 1990s. I had many of you in the 2000s when I was the principal here at, from 2000 to 2010 here at Kanoa Kaina. And I still have some of you today as my students, like Ko'o, who just introduced herself, or over there, who is with Malama Honua Charter School, and she's taking a course on education with Aloha, how to teach Aloha 
and how to live with aloha. Um, it's an online class that uh, my company, Kua Kanaka, is uh, providing for DOE teachers. So many, many of you were my students at one point or another, and I really want to mahalo all of you specifically for being here today and for continuing, right? This is nobody can do anything if it stops with them. Right? That's not how it works. It has to continue. If you're going to do something good, make sure that you figure out how it can continue. And you folks are the continuation of the things that Nale and I started, and we weren't the only one. We have so many other, our other founders, like Auntie Val is here, Auntie Kiyomailani is here, Auntie Anuhea, Auntie Auhea. So there are still those of us who started Kanu Kaina in 2000, and I want to acknowledge and mahalo you folks as well. So aloha. Oops. Yes. No leila o anake ku hina hina ku i kahakai kahakalao ko u inoa a o ki ia ku u ohana. Uh, my oldest daughter, Iini, our oldest daughter, she just got married in Waipio, and there is a picture of us in Waipio at the ceremony. O Honolulu ku u oneha nau. O Hawaii, ku umokupuni. O kukui haile, ku u ahupua'a. O waipio, ku u avava. O hi ilave, ku u vailele. A o ku naka, ku u aina. What I have to share today is what I learned. But our kupuna said, not all knowledge is contained in one school. Not all knowledge comes from one source. So if you heard the story a little bit different, that's all right, right? We don't have to be right and wrong. We can just all get different sources and learn from different sources. That's what our kupuna said. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. We are going to interact. We're going to do stuff while I'm talking. So whenever you hear or you see, when, when I say the word ha'alilio, can everybody say that? Ha'alilio, I want you guys to shaka. Okay, can we all make a shaka? Yay. Okay, one more time. Ha'alilio, boom, shaka, boom, yes. When I say ku'oko'a, you go and, whew. Ah, uh, oh yeah, that's ku okoa. When I say kawi kia uli, thumbs up, all right? When I say pelekane nui, you pai. And when I say palani, you hehe, you stop, okay? Let's see how, it, one more time. Ha'alilio was what? Shaka, mai kai. Ku okoa? Ba-boom, ai. Kawi kia uli? Thumbs up. Pelikane Nui and Palani. Hey, all right, I think we got it. Here we are. So, the very first time that La Kuokoa was celebrated was on November 28, 1843. So, those of you who know some math, try and figure out how long ago that was. But it was kind of a long time ago, right? It was at least 120 years ago that that 100 and what? <laughs> math. Okay, who's our math people? How many years ago? Go ahead. 180. There we go. 180 years ago, today, the first present, uh, celebration of La Kuokoa. La meaning day, ku okoa, meaning to stand, ku okoa, apart, which is our Hawaiian word for independence. All right? Remember our, our, um, our, mea, um, yes, because I didn't see anybody doing nothing when I said ku okoa, hello, okay, egg already, okay. Let's try that one more time. La ku okoa, boom, my kai, ah, oh yeah, all right. So, the story kind of starts in 1823, which is about 20 years earlier, when King Liholiho, who was the oldest son of Kamehameha I, and his wife, Queen Kamamalu, go to England. They travel halfway around the world to get to the British uh, um, 
center of, to London, which is the capital of England at that time. But Queen Kamamalu becomes very sick and she passes away. And Liho Liho is so sad and he's also sick, so he also passes away before they ever meet with the British royals. And so that journey was kind of in vain, right? They went and they make in England and all that came home was their kino, no treaty, no uh, alliance with Great Britain. About 20 years later, his younger brother, Kaui Kiauli, who was Kamehameha III, on April 8th, 1842, decided to appoint three Kanaka, three people, to try again and secure recognition of Hawaii as an independent kingdom from the United States, from Pelikane Nui, and from Palani. Uh, oh yeah, my kai. And one of those three guys that went along was Timoteo Ha'alilio. Uh, oh yeah, Timoteo Ha'alilio was a Hawaiian chief. And he grew up with King Kawikeuli. He was like a Hanai brother to him. And he also became his secretary when they got older. He was the head of the kingdom's treasury, so he controlled all the kala. And he helped to write the Constitution of 1840. And so he became the official Hawaiian ambassador to Europe and to the United States because he could speak English kind of good. And according to what people talk, told us about him, he was a great observer. What's the Hawaiian word for observe? Kilo, Kilo right? See, they was doing Kilo for a long time already, right? He watched everything. Wherever he went, he went into museums when he was in Europe. He went check out the bridges. He went to the churches. He went everywhere. And he checked out everything. That's really Hawaiian, you know, to check out everything. You don't walk around, la, 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 and in the air, no, see nothing. No, you go and you maka'ala, you watch what's happening. And that's what Ha'alilio did. He was very, very maka'ala. And he was also very akamai, another Hawaiian quality, right? Extremely akamai. He was on point. He told you what he felt like, but he did it with aloha, right? He was always kind. He was warm-hearted. He had good manners. All things that our kupuna taught us how to be. Unfortunately, on his way home, they just had stopped back in the United States and they were on the ship from New England to Hawaii. But he got sick too because these were all new diseases that our people had no immunity against. And so he went hala, he died on the ship back from New England to Hawaii and never made it back to his beloved homeland. So that was who? Timothy Ha'alilio. Boom. Aoya. My kai. All right, here's a few things that they wrote in the newspaper uh, in 1848. Let me put on my glasses here because I cannot see. 1845, Kalamai, about him. And I'm going to read it in Hawaiian because I want you guys to realize how much Hawaiian you already know. And then you can read the English if you like. Hemao mea iho no ha'alilio. O ko'olau kona kona aina ha'anao. He mau kanaka ko i ko i kona mau makua. Make kona makua kane i kona wā kama li'i a mahope lilo kona makua hine o e ho i o e seka a ke ola nei no i kia aina a o molokai. I kona makahiki e valu, komo oia i loko o ka ohana o ka mō i kamehameha e kolu a noho loa ia me ia ma hilo la ko ia manawa. I kona makahiki umi kuma kolu Komo o ha'alilio i loko o ke kula upi namu ma ma honolulu a a'o a'o oia i ka olelo pelikania, which is pelikania, same thing, yeah, pelikane, mai kai. So this is a little bit, yeah, a'o oia, mai kai, yay! Um, this is a little bit about ha'alilio. The other guy who went along this journey as a diplomat of the Hawaiian kingdom was a guy named Sir George Simpson. He was from Scotland. He was an explorer and a businessman, and he was the governor-in-chief um, of the Hudson Bay Company. They were on the northwest coast of uh, the United States. It wasn't the United States yet, but that's where they, where they are now, and they were fur traders. 
He was a man of great influence and international standing. People around the world knew him, and he supported the idea of Hawaiian independence, and that's why he was recruited to go along to his homeland, which was uh, Britain, and, and hopefully get Brit Hawaiian independence from the, the um, Queen of England. He left for Pelikane Nui, Maikai, via a ship. He went to Sitka, which is Alaska now, then on another ship all the way to Pelikane Nui, Maikai. And then he met Ha'alilio and Richards in Pelikane Nui, and he traveled with them to Belgium and to France, or Palani, Maikai. The third guy was an American named Reverend William Richards, and he came with the second party of the missionaries in 1823. But he didn't stay a missionary for very long. In, in 1838, he resigned from the mission and became a translator, a government translator for King Kauikeauli, and he also helped to write the very first Hawaiian constitution. Um, he became the secretary to Ha'alilio during this trip, and he had full power of attorney so that he could actually sign for the king. He also became Hawaii's first minister of public instruction or education. So he was the one who helped us set up our education system uh, under Kaui Keauli's rule. So those were the three delegates, um, and they were given full power on behalf of uh, King Kaui Keauli and the Hawaiian kingdom to enter into treaties, and to make sure that Hawaii became recognized as an independent kingdom. So here's how Ha'alilio and Richards got to England. First, they traveled by steamship to Mexico. Then they rode a donkey and they walked all the way across Mexico. Then they took another uh, ship first to the United States, and then in the United States, they took the train all the way up uh, north, and then from there, they took another ship to Pelikane Nui. Uh, oh yeah. And in England, Ha'alilio meets Queen Victoria, and she's the ruler of Pelikane Nui. And he also meets King Louis Philippe, who is the king of Palani. Maikai. And then, on November 28, 1843, at the Court of London, they signed this document called the Anglo-Franco Proclamation. It was uh, a piece of a palapala. You see the palapala right there? That's the actual palapala that was signed. That recognized Hawaii as being ku o koa. Woo. Ku o koa, ai, or independent. And the two nations that first recognized that was Pelikane Nui and Palani, Maikai. So from then on, La Ku Okoa was celebrated throughout Hawaii. It is our most important holiday because we were the first non-white nation or kingdom to be recognized by the, they called it the family of nations at that time. That was Europe and America, all nations where everybody was haole, which is not a bad word, that's just what they was. And, but they didn't really like to give kuokoa to other people, right? So Hawaii was the very first one that this group recognized as being independent. And why? Because we had our act together. That's why Kaui Keauli had his act together. We had a constitution, just like all they had. We had a school system, a better school system than them, because in Europe and in America, you had to have money, you had to have kala to go to school. And if you were a girl, you couldn't go to school because only boys were allowed to go to school. And if you um, came from a poor family, you had no chance of being educated, right? But in Hawaii, everybody was 
was had to, it was mandatory, just like today, everybody had to go to school. And even if maybe today you didn't feel like going to school, you still gotta come to school because that's the law, right? And that's the law we had. So we were, to my knowledge, the first nation in the whole world that made sure that every cake you went to school, it didn't matter if they were a kane or a wahine, a boy or a girl, it didn't matter if they had money or no money, Everybody was allowed to learn, everybody was encouraged to learn, and we were able to build a thriving kingdom, right, as a result of this education that Kaui Keauli started here in Hawaii. And so in 1874, when this day was celebrated again by everybody in Hawaii, every year they had huge celebrations, Lele Ohoku, who was the baby brother to King Kalakaua and Queen Lili Kalani? he wrote in the newspaper Kaleo o Kalahui, O keia la, oia kala i loa aia kako kanohona ku o koa. Maluna o ko kako aina makuahine nei, ahe la ho i keia, no, e ke kanaka Hawaii, e hau o liai. So, this is the day, Leleo Hoku writes in the newspaper, that we, the Hawaiian people, got independence. And this is the day that all of us Hawaiians should be what? How early, right? How early? Can everybody make a big smile? How early? Aye. Everybody today should be how early because we were recognized as an independent nation. And that was something that we celebrated and that we continue to celebrate because we never gave up that independence. There is no record that any Hawaiian said, especially any, any important Hawaiian said, I don't want to be independent. I don't want to be Hawaiian. As a matter of fact, we have petitions, right? You guys seen the, the Kuei petitions, right? With tens of thousands of Hawaiians signing and saying, we don't want to be a part of America. So our kuleana now is to ho'omau and to show happiness today that these three guys went to England, went and got this uh, declaration signed, and we have been recognized as being independent. And in that way, that is still something that continues today. So now it's 2023. And the Olelo no Eau that was coined during the time of Kawikeoli still is true today. And that Olelo no Eau says, Wa'au Hawaii ke oli no nei ma lama lama. Hawaii is enlightened for the brightness of day is here. And the translation of that is, Hawaii is in an era of education. And just like in the 1840s, when this, this Olelo no Eau first appeared, when uh, Kawiki Uli created this first education system, today, Hawaii is still in an era of education, and it's education with aloha. Education with aloha, which is ea for short. And so, what does that mean? Well, it means that you folks are learning and celebrating our history, including Laku Okoa. You know, when we went to school, you can ask all the old funny daddies in here, when we went to school, never have no Laku Okoa celebration, right? Anybody remember, those of you over 40, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> 30 even, right? Do you guys remember celebrating Laku Okoa? No, never have, just like it never happened. They tried to erase it. They didn't want us to know about these things. They didn't want us to know we were smart. They didn't want us to know we were all these good things, right? kind, caring, warm-hearted, all those things that Ha'alilio was. And so the, our history was forgotten. But today, because of education with Aloha Ea, we are learning about our history again, and we're celebrating our history again like we are here. And I want to thank all the organizers for creating this event here. Because if you don't do it, nobody's going to do it for us, right? We can't wait for some guy on some white horse coming down the road and helping us, right? Forget about that. Hey, he ain't coming. So we got to do it for ourselves, right? It's our kuleana. And so mahalo for taking care of our kuleana.
Kanoka Aina and all the other charter schools that are here today and all the other schools as well. And we are relearning our language, right? Today I heard so much Olelo Hawaii already and we're going to sing a, a song in Olelo Hawaii in just a moment. So the language is coming back. Right? Not all the way here yet it means not everybody can speak fluent Hawaiian, but everybody in this room is a Hawaiian language speaker. All of you are Hawaiian language speakers because you know pow, you know all hundreds and hundreds of different words that you wouldn't know if they were Chinese or if they were German or if they were Swahili or whatever, right? So you know lots of words, you know lots of songs, you know lots of chants, you know olelo no eau, and that's the first step of starting to speak your language, right? And every time you get a little better, a little better, and bye bye you can talk, sorry. We're also practicing our culture again. We're taking care of the aina, and we're working towards economic and political independence, because it's, one thing to have a card that says, oh, I am a citizen of the Kingdom of Hawaii, but I still shop at Walmart and I'm still working for the federal government and I'm still doing this and that, and then I'm only limit, limited in my independence, right? But if we're economically independent, if we don't need anybody else for us to survive and thrive in our islands, then we can be truly independent. We're also creating our own systems of education. So here at Kanu, I, we had at one point a zero to five program. We have our K-12 school. We had a teacher licensing program. And what my um, daughter Iini and I, and actually Polani as well, what we have started is a program called Ea Ecoversity. So now we're doing college for Hawaiians. So that means from womb to tomb, from the babies to the kupuna, we will have created a system that takes care of all of our kanaka, no matter how old they are, and reconnects us to our culture, our language, our way of life. And as the more we are learning about our kupuna, the more we are understanding that their ike, our ike kupuna, is where it's at. It's that ike kupuna that's gonna help us survive here in Hawaii in the future. And so we call that ancient is modern. Traditional is contemporary. And certainly when it comes to education, we are trying to teach you the way our kupuna taught. And that's the only way that has worked for Hawaiians ever, <laughs> right? Because the other system has not worked, clearly not worked. And so by doing things the way we, our kupuna did, we will succeed and we will progress. All right. So, as I mentioned, every year there were big celebrations during Laku Okoa. And one of the things that Hawaiians love to do is to haku mele. Whenever an exciting event happens, we haku a mele. When my former opuna were born, each one, I haku a mele for them. My daughter, when she was born, Hepolani Makamai, I haku a mele for her, right? That's, that's Hawaiian style. You haku mele for an important event. And this mele right here was also um, uh, composed uh, by a Hawaiian, and he just put WDN on the bottom of the newspaper article, so we're not exactly sure who he was, but a lot of people feel that his name was actually W.D. Naono Hielua. Um, and he published this song about the Laku Okoa o Hawaii in the newspaper. So it's a wonderful song that just talks about Hawaii and us rejoicing, being happy because it's Independence Day and that we should be so proud uh, and, and satisfied of the blessing of being a Hawaiian nation and for being able to celebrate Independence Day. And so the hui of the song is this is a wonderful day, never seen before. That's the first time ever, as I mentioned before, that a non-white nation was recognized as independent. And even during the days of Kauikeuli and Liho Liho and the early days of Kamehameha, this is the first time that people heard that Hawaii was independent. And then it talks about each of the islands, and many of you are from these different islands or you have ohana on those islands. And so the way we're gonna do this is I'm gonna 
play some music and then we're all going to sing together the Hela Kupanahanoke ia part. Um, we'll, we'll practice it first a little bit. And then whoever can read along, just read along the other the verses, our kind of our read along thing, okay? I never did this before, so this is a, this is a test, okay? <laughs> Consider this a test, okay? So I'm going to start right away because as soon as I press one thing, then we got to do the other thing. So it starts out with, Hela kupanaha no keia. Can we say that? Iike ole ia mamua. Ya kauikea uli. Me liho liho. Me na la mua o kameha meha. Hela kupana no keia i ke ole ia mamua ya kaui ke au uli meli holi ho mena la mua o ka meha meha. E ku ka ko a oli oli puro ka laku o ko a o Hawaii nei ua hiki no ya ka ko ke ha anui a ha akena i ka po mai ka i o ka lahui no ka laku o ko a o ke aupuni he laku o ko a no ke ia i i ke ile ia mamua. Ya kaui ke au uli me li ho li ho me na la mua o ka meha meha ki ku mai nei Hawaii ua hau oli na kua hivi ua ha ano o mauna kea ua hipa hipa o mauna loa. Hulo, hulo, hua la lai no ka lāku o koa o ke au puni. He lāku o koa no ke ia, i i ke ole ia mamua. I can hear you. Ya kau i ke au uli me li ho li ho, me na la mua o ka meha meha. Ke ku mai nei o Maui, me na hono o Piilani. Ke li nau nei lako, au hea ka la hoi hoi ea, i maa Maui a mako, e ia ka he lāku o koa. He lāku o koa anō ke ia, i i ke ole ia mamua. Ia kau i ke au uli me li ho li ho, me na lā mua o ka meha meha. Ke ku mai nei o ahu, me ke kua hivi o ka ala. Ua ala mai daimana hila, me ka pu'u, pu'u o waina. Ua hau oli a oli oli no ka lāku o koa o ke au puni. He lāku panaha no ke ia, i i ke ole ia mamua. Ya kau i ke au uli me li ho li ho me na la mua o ka meha meha. Ki ku mai nei kawai me na moku au i ke kai no la kou ka ha upu ana ka mana o ha o ha o maa loko. I ka hiki ana aku o ka lono 
He lā ku o koa no ki au puni. He lā ku panaha no ke ia. I i ke ole ia mamua. Ia kau i ke au uli me li ho li ho. Me nā lā mua o ka meha meha. Me nā lā mua. Me nā lā mua o ka meha meha. So what we did is we took ancient and we made it modern, right? We took an old song and we put modern music to it. And that's what this is all about, right? We mix it ancient and modern together and we're coming up with a new menu. We're coming up with new dishes. We're coming up with new stuff. That's Hawaiian, right? That because the foundation is Hawaiian. The celebration of Laku Okoa is Hawaiian. Celebrating the different islands and how they celebrate Laku Okoa is Hawaiian. And um, being grateful that we have been recognized as being independent and we ourselves recognize ourselves as being independent is really truly a wonderful reason to partay. So I wish you folks a wonderful day. Have a lots and lots of fun. Enjoy yourselves and be how holy. Remember Lele Ohoku said, how holy, how holy ai kako. Let us all be happy and celebrate this wonderful, wonderful part of our history. Mahalo e mahalo e kalehulehu, mahalo e na makua, mahalo e na kupuna, mahalo e na liyo Hawaii, mahalo e na au makua, mahalo e na kua, mahalo e. Mahalo Nui, and uh, thank you for allowing me to share a little bit of my na'o with you folks today. Check, check. One more round of applause for Auntie Ku Kahakalo. I think Auntie Ku would appreciate a roll call of the, all the schools in the house because we have way more schools than I think we all realize in our house. We had a few last minute additions. So we're going to start with Kanu with the AO and then we're going to end with Kanu with the AO. And hopefully none of these visiting schools beat you folks. But can we get an AO from Kanu Okaina? Kua Okala, Alo Kehau, Kamakau, Hakipu'u, Malama Honua, Kawai Hono Kana'oau, Kawai Kini, on their way. Kanui Kapono, and did we forget any other kula that are in the house today? Okay, let's give it back to Kanu Okaina. Hello, my kako. Uh, my name is uh, Trevor Atkins. I'm the advisor for Kea Hawaii. Uh, and this is Hi'iaka Aipia White Eagle from Halau Kumana representing Kea Hawaii. Uh, we just wanted to say a few words about uh, the purpose of today and, and, and what we're up to. Uh, and then we're going to introduce our next speaker. Uh, but first, just a mahalo to, to our host, to the Aina of Waimea, and also to the, the staff of Kanoa Kaina. Can we give them a big round of applause for hosting this? <laughs> so
So you may or may not know that each kula has a student representative that comes together every summer to figure out what they want to prioritize for the year based on what they think that their, their peers, their, the other students at their school would want. And so this year's Aha Haumana wanted to do this. This was their number one priority. And so I'm going to have Hi'iaka talk a little bit about the theme for the conference and, and sort of why they wanted to make this their number one priority this year. Um, aloha kako. Um, o hi'iaka ka imi loa ai pia wai rigo ko uinoa. As Kumu Trevor said, um, I'm from Oahu. I'm representing Halau Kumana and Ke'ea Hawai'i. Um, so this summer, me and all of my hoas who are sitting here today came together. Um, we were here for one week, and of course, the week that we came, there was a hurricane. It was, um, it was really great, though, but we ended up getting stuck in one of uh, our uncle's garage for like two days. Um, during those two days, um, we had a lot of ca uh, plans canceled. And luckily, Uncle La'a brought in a lot of guest speakers to come and talk to us from all over the islands through Zoom. And um, we learned, like, many different things. He hooked us up with so many different guest speakers, and we were so grateful to him because we didn't know what we were going to do if, you know, he didn't bring um, all of us these opportunities to get to learn from all these other people. Um, the main things that we learned, though, from Uncle um, Kaniloa was about Hawaii's land, laws, and language, which is our theme for today's La Kuokoa conference. We um, started off by learning about our Hawaiian laws and how they can help us today because if you don't know how to navigate the world now and you don't know how to use all these laws to help get your aina back, um, olelo more, survive throughout this new and changing world, um, we won't make it. So one of the main things for us was to learn our laws and our rights as Hawaiians. Another thing was our olelo. We can't lose our olelo. It's who we are. It's where we came from. We didn't write down things on books. We passed it on orally through oli, through mo'olelo. So it's very important that all of our schools continue to olelo and that we learn more about our past so we can help um, develop and continue on through our future. Our last thing that we learned about is Aina. Obviously everyone here knows Aina is the most important thing and a lot of us are losing Aina. So we focused on how we can get Aina back, how we can better our Aina and um, how to malama Aina because our, malam our Aina malamas us so we must malama our Aina. So, yeah, that's kind of what our theme is today. We chose these three things, which were the, our favorite things that we learned, and we hope that you guys um, take all this information and enjoy all the rotations that we have for you guys today. Um, you take all of this home back to your school, whether it's on this aina or if you're on other islands. We hope you take it back home with you. And you remember this day because this is amazing. We're so lucky and happy to have all these different schools here with us. A big mahalo again to Kanu for hosting us. We wouldn't have been able to make this happen if you guys didn't open your, your doors for us and let us all join you guys here today for Laku Oko'a. Mahalo. So with that said, uh, again, Hiyaka said that one of the inspirations was the, the Zoom speakers we had over the summer. And so we decided we were going to fly one in today for you folks um, to share a little bit about what he shared with us. Uh, and he also brought along his wahine. Um, so I'm going to introduce to the stage Uncle Kani Loa and Auntie Johanna Kamaunu. And as they make their way up, I'll let you folks know that um, they're longtime educators and teachers from Maui. And so we asked them to speak not only about land, laws, language, and some of the things that Kea learned about this summer, but also to share a little bit about what's going on on Maui, because some of us, uh, it's, hard, it's hard to discern what's true and what's not and what's going on over there, and so we're hoping to hear a little bit more about Ea on Maui. Uh, so please welcome to the stage Uncle Kaniloa and Auntie Johanna.
Hello, my kako. I wear my emotions on my sleeve. I'm a very emotional person. Um, to be invited here is actually a great honor for me. Uh, we, we spoke in many places. And we speak to a lot of makua. Uh, and, you know, to be in an audience of this magnitude for us is a great honor. To be among the youth is a great honor. Because in your eyes, I see the answers in the language. I feel a mana. In your presence, I feel the hope. Delving into what we do uh, for the last 20 years, which has been a very actually short time compared to many others that we met throughout this Huakai. Um, we know Olelo Hawaii. We're the generations that weren't given the opportunity. Um, and so, always to hear the Olelo. Fills me. I feel the strength from those that have walked on our land. So, anyway, my name is Kanilo Kamaunu. I come from Maui. Uh, this is Johanna Kamaunu. Her actual last name is Laimana, and she has attachments to this island. And so do I on my father's side as well as her. She comes from the island of Oahu. Um, and we've been together for the last 42 years. Um, you know, we're kind of like ice and, and fire. Because uh, we always challenge each other. We, I mean, uh, but we get along, you know, it's, it, it's how we are. And so we were asked to talk. I gave, I gave a little thing to, uh, I guess, the heads that were putting this together. And they asked us to be here. So we're with a group called Huipono Ike Kanavai. You guys are fine. Uh, Huipono Ike Kanavai was created uh, for the mere purpose of discussion. We were a group of four people. Um, and it was my wife, myself, our two other companions who are doing other things today. Um, Roman uh, Kahealii and Justin Costa. Because we, were, we got to know each other, we were wanting to know what are we fighting for? Because we would go to these meetings on waters, on lands, and all these things. So what are we fighting for? And should we be here? Is it a waste of our time to come to these meetings and talk to these people and give presentations? Because a lot of times those things are hopeless. But we were there, so we wanted to know what is our purpose here. And we started to look at, you know, we were learning about laws. Jocelyn was very active in, in being in court and challenging stuff on, as Kanaka. She was one of the people that were arrested in Waehu with 16 other kupuna. Of a just Malama Aina. They went to Malama Aina and they were arrested. I mean, SWAT came, everything. And the people, she was the youngest one. She was in her 50s. But they arrested all the kupuna like they did over here, Mauna Kea. SWAT, everything. I mean, and these people could, you know, they were older people. But we started to look at the laws that we had. And so our discussion for two years. We went in, we, we got together as groups, and we were lucky because of our work. We were able to get together at least four times a week. We would start at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we would finish at 10 o'clock at night. That's how interesting what we were looking at and what our people did and what our kupuna left for us. 
And we found out that this was stuff that we needed to use. After the two years, we decided to go out to all those meetings again that we felt hopeless, whether it was county, state, whether it was just a community meeting. We went out and we wanted to prove whether or not what we learned and we discussed for two years of our time was worth it. And we did, and we found out. One of the first things that came up was the water issue. Right? Oha comes with this proposal, $150 for the, the kuleana, the kuleana tax. So we challenged them because the, the county council is going to judge on giving $150 a year for kuleana. So we challenged them because there was an old law there. Says that all the commutation, all the taxes on the lands that were called kuleana was already taken care of. So how are you charging us taxes? So if you go and look at Maui, the kupuna aina, I think it was, exemption. This comes out of that Oha thing for kuleana exemption. Every island pays a yearly tax of about 150. That was what was offered. Maui. Because we gave them the old law and because they were lawmakers, they had to abide the law. The law was no taxes. So Maui's exemption is zero. Because of what our kupuna, not because we did anything. It was a kupuna. So we're here today to give you that ike. I'm not going to say manao because manao is opinion. Ike is knowledge. You need knowledge, and that's why we're here. We're not kumu. Yeah? we students. Haumana. So we don't come here as, as your educators. We come here as haumana, because we're still learning. And we're imparting the lesson that we learned from those wiser than us. And we just took that and we use it. So, this is my wife, Johanna Kamano. She has her things laid out. She looked at me, oh, you talk too long. But that's, that's, that's me as an entertainer. But, so, I'm going to let her do her thing, and then I'll be back. I'm not going to let you do it. You want to step there? You want to yeah. hold the mic? If you'll um, bear with me, I think what's important right now is to give you some hard facts. <laughs> My mother, as um, Uncle Connie was saying, was involved in an altercation on her property in Waiau. And I was called in being the eldest in the family and one of the only two living on Maui to come in and assist her. I went to court that day and I left that courtroom very disappointed, very frustrated. I'd come to an arena to participate in something I had no understanding of, and that was the law. I didn't even know if I could open my mouth in the courtroom. I didn't know what the words were that could be used in the courtroom. I didn't even know what my mother was being charged with exactly. And I didn't know that there were 15 others who had been charged with trespassing. So when I left, I was feeling really frustrated and just unsure of how to proceed. But in that courtroom, J Jocelyn kind of led an argument and it helped me see that somebody knew a little bit more about the law than I did. Bottom line is, we made an agreement some months later that after my first grandchild was born, we would get together, meet at the law library, and study kingdom law. It is one of the few places at that time in which we could find the law as it was written. And that was about 2008. I walked into, the, into that library realizing 
okay, this is just like any other library, right? I'll just pull out a book and read it. <laughs> didn't work that way. In fact, it was as if it was on another level. I didn't understand what I was reading. I couldn't make sense of what they were trying to say on that paper. And even though Jocelyn would explain some things to me, the bottom line was, I didn't see it. How could you possibly see things like that, the way this is written? But we persevered. And as in that case where the 15 were arrested, um, they were also exonerated. And it's because of what we found in the law. And it's not only because of what we found in the law, but it was also because of divine intervention. Whether you call it your kupuna, whether we call it keokua, there is no way that kind of information could have come to us. We're not scholars. We're not lawyers. And as I already told you, I did not understand a lot. But so much came to us while we were in that law library. I'll go straight to the four points of doctrine that made a difference for us in our studies. This is found in the compiler's preface of 1846, Kumu Kanavai. At the very start, Mr. Rickard, a Haole frontier attorney, at that time he's the attorney general for the kingdom, comments on the process of creating the Kumu Kanavai. 1846. Up until this time, there were no real enactments of law. Every, and I'm talking about written enactments. Everything was oral. But now that they're moving towards a constitutional government and having rights, things had to change. And the change was difficult. We got people who understood the ODA and the people understood it well. And you have foreigners, visitors, who didn't know the old laws. They recognized written enactments. And the two bodies were not living together, not Pono. And that's what he brought out as one of the few things he recognized that was a difference between Hawaii and the augmented population of foreigners. Anyway, let me get to the four points, because from then you can see how you can apply this as you navigate the world. The first case is, I mean, the first statement that we find in the compiler's preface says, many cases must necessarily arise that can only be measured by the old law. Cases today are going to come up that can only arise by the old law. Is that true? Yes or no? No, oh, not sure. What about the argument for TMT? Did they go back to new law or did they go back to the old law? They looked to the old laws. They looked to the things that were sacred of this place. And all along the line, coming forward, they brought up all of those laws that was significant to their arguments. You're prevailing. And you made the world prevail with you. That was significant. Land Commission awards. People are fighting for their properties. How do you fight for your property if somebody else claims to have it? There's an old law. What is the old law? The original old law is the Mahele. And what does the Mahele say? that anyone who put in a claim has a right to that claim and his heirs, not just anybody, his heirs. So that tells us the land should never go outside of the family. Is that significant for today? Does today's law tell us that? We found out that it didn't. Um, what's a good case for that? <clears throat> Um, a friend of ours just completed a case. She responded to an article in the newspaper calling for heirs 
for Kami Kona. She put in her application, she put in her paperwork saying that she was an heir. Now the trick or the goal is to prove your lineage to the awardee. She couldn't do it, but she still prevailed. How did she prevail? She was able to show that her family lived in the same area as this other Kamekona. She was also able to show that they could have been related, but there was nothing to show the direct relationship to. So she calls in a genealogist, and this genealogist is significant. She took the time to certify her learning, and so she comes forward almost as an expert to the court. And one of the questions the court asked her is, what is your opinion of this relationship? Is she related, or could she be related to this Kamekona, this Land Commission awardee? And the genealogist says, that's not our job. Our job is to find the facts and present them to you. And it's up to others to make that decision. So he goes, okay, one step further then. The question is, what is the likelihood of this person being related? And she says, in that case, according to the standards that we use in research, it's more likely that she is related to this person. And the judge said, likely is 51% of the law. He found for her. And you know, she ended up getting two thirds of this property that she didn't even know was around to a relative she wasn't sure of, and yet she prevailed. The other part we learned is that the question of how much she could get from the property was a big problem. Evidently, the awardee passed away and left the land to his wife. The wife now inherits what we call dower rights. The court wanted to know, what were the dower rights in 1864 when the, when the awardee passed away? And we had to go research the law. Thank goodness the law library was there. Thank goodness the old cases were there. And we found some cases that showed what the law was at that time. We didn't go and tell the judge what we learned. We showed the judge what was written on the records. At the time, a woman can only claim two thirds of her husband's estate as her dower rights. Oh, I'm sorry, one third as her dower rights. The other two thirds goes to the family. So the court said, Oh, you made me lose my place. <laughs> Dower rights, right? <laughs> okay. So the court said she is only entitled to one third. She couldn't take the whole property and sell that out to outside of the family. So if anything, what she transferred to the present day is one third. So our friend Carol uh, prevailed for two thirds of the property. That was an old law and everything was based on the old law. And that's only one thing. You know what the old law also helped me to realize? Oh wait, I think we have to do something. You do it. Aloha, I call my yahoo. I was supposed to release the elementary keiki for Kanoka Aina <laughs> a little while back and I know that some of them needs to use a lua and their workshops are starting. So elementary kumu, you guys can kui luna. And elementary keiki, you can kui luna. 
and you folks can exit. One, follow your teacher one by one. Thank you for being quiet. My kai. Okay, the second part, the second point that's significant to us, and we've used all these four points in all of our arguments. New laws or amendments of the old cannot di divest rights previously acquired. If you have already earned a right, whether it's on your own or through your kupuna, that right is still yours. Um, as uh, descendants of a land commission awardee, we claim our right as subjects of the kingdom because of that land commission award. The third one is, means and remedies may be altered, but the rights themselves, if vested, cannot be constitutionally disturbed. Not even the constitution. Now you're probably wondering why we haven't used all of these arguments, why we haven't prevailed with these arguments before. I kind of think it's because we weren't convinced that they worked. But we are more convinced today that they do work. And they're the most powerful laws that work. So that's why these points are significant. You can use it in any challenge, any challenge. I used it in the DOE when there was a problem with my, uh, with education in one of our, our immersion classes. I used it to fight a traffic ticket. It works, everything still works. Um, but there's a lot of good reasons to use it. Okay, and I want you to have all of these. The third one is, is it a third one? Or we're on the fourth one already. And this kind of puts the whole package together. Is it off? Okay, technical problems. While they're working at getting it on, let me share with you what the fourth point is. Another admitted doctrine, oops. Another of the admitted doctrines, even in the exposition of new laws, is that the old law must first be understood. And the mischief intended to be cured by that law in order to apply a remedy. Now think that through again. 
You have to understand the old law. And you have to understand the mischief that the old law was supposed to have remedied before you can apply a new remedy today. Um, there's so many to choose from. I went to another friend who um, has land that he claimed through his kupuna, Pehuino. And the county is claiming ownership of this particular property. Um, when we went to court, Henry's claim was that he is a descendant of Pehuino, and they are still existing today, and this land has always been in their, their family. The court asked MEO why they think they might prevail this time, because Henry has been brought to court to, by them for four times already, and each time it ends the same way. Henry loses, but nothing changes. So the court says, what is going to change? And they say, well, we have other measures we can take if we prevail again this time. So they go forward with the case. The bottom line is, whenever Henry is asked, did you trespass on this property? And he says, as far as the TMK is concerned, I have nothing to do with it. The Land Commission Award to Pehuino, Michael Puna, that's what I'm on and they could never get him to budge from that. The finding in that court case was that Henry was guilty of trespassing on TMK, on the TMK of MEO. Uh, procedure is that the attorneys write up an order, the court signs it, and then they can move forward in removing him from the property. But in this case, the court did not sign the order. Till today, the court has not signed the order. So Henry has not had to serve any time. Uh, he has had to leave the property. But it still leaves the question open. How can we understand the law? In the, in the case of the speeding ticket, I really didn't know how fast I was going when I got stopped. And that was my argument to the officer who had the laser gun out. And I said, you know, I'm not really sure. And he says, well, here it is. You can read it yourself. And I says, well, I'm not going to agree that it's correct. So we went to court eventually. And in court, um, I was so inexperienced that I couldn't even open for one question without being shut down with objections, foundations, irrelevant. You know, I, I just didn't know how to do that at the time. So I said, OK, I'm going to wait. Because at the end, everyone gets the chance to say something. So this was my final argument after it looked like I was going to lose the case. And the argument was, when I do diagnostics on my car, I'm not an expert mechanic. And though this officer was trained in the use of the laser gun and how to test it, he is not an expert witness. And based on that, the judge dismissed the case with, a, with prejudice. So I prevailed on that. I jumped, out, I jumped my way out of the courtroom almost. But you know that showed me that you really have to look at the law to see how it's written. We looked through the case laws at that time and based it on the 30 miles over the limits um, uh, charge and on the weighing of s illegal drugs. They both require tools or instruments to be used, but the instrument is an expert witness, and the instrument has to be validated and be able to be questioned, and they can only be questioned by those that made it. At the time, the state doesn't provide expert witness for that kind of situation, so they had none. And that's the only reason why we prevailed. And I brought all those points out in my argument. I was really lucky. But the court did admonish me that I would not drive through that area at that speed anymore. <laughs> I agreed. She was right. 
Um, okay, so if you can remember those four things, many cases must necessarily arise that can only be measured by the old law. New laws and amendments of the old cannot divest rights previously acquired. Means and remedies may be altered, that's how you get the rights, but the rights themselves, if they're vested, cannot be constitutionally disturbed. And the last one, even in the exposition of new laws, the creation of new laws, the old law must first be understood and the mischief intended to be cured by it in order to apply the remedy. We still have the chance to apply a remedy. We still have a chance to reclaim what is ours. And we're trying to do that every day. And I, we're overwhelmed because the potential here is just magnified 100, 200 times. Uh, we never saw this kind of response or interest in all the years that we were researching and protesting and advocating. It's hard to speak. Mahalo. I hope the world for you. One more round of applause for Auntie Johanna. And also for Uncle Kaniloa. I think if there's one thing that I heard was that they, they want us to not pay attention and, and not know the details of these things, but we can win in court if we simply just do our homework. And mahalo to you for doing the homework and making it easy for us and just kind of bringing the major points forward so that we don't have to necessarily do all the digging, although I think that we, we should. And if you folks are interested in hearing more, they are doing a workshop during the second breakout session. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna release you folks by whichever breakout session you folks signed up for. We have a, a 45 minute breakout session uh, might go a little bit over time, and then we're going to hurry off to our second breakout session before lunch. So two breakout sessions. Everybody should have signed up for two. If you didn't sign up for two, you're going to come up to the front of the stage after everybody else leave, and we'll find a place for you. Okay, but don't all stand up yet. Uh, I'm going to call you folks by the rotations and try to let you know where to go. So if you are, if you signed up for La Kuokoa with Auntie Kau Isai and Kamuela Yim, you're going to be in the library and you can kui luna and follow somebody that knows where they're going. Okay, and I think I can talk over the noise, so if you folks stay quiet, I can call the rest. So if you signed up for Rethinking the Mahele with Uncle Donovan Preza, you can kui luna and come behind me to the room behind me that says uh, Donovan Preza Rethinking the Mahele, right back here. If you signed up for Oracy and the impact of literacy. I'm going to point out Uncle Poki'i to you. He's in the back in a light blue shirt uh, and he's got his hand up. And uh, you can join him and he'll take you over to Kawainui classroom. So, Oracy and the impact of literacy with Poki'i Sito in Kawainui classroom. If you signed up for transforming county government with Hokulani Fortunato and Malia Silva Mikin. You're in Pu'upalehu directly behind me, directly behind the microphone, transforming county government, Hokulani and Malia. If you signed up for Aloha Aina Research with Noel Peralto and friends, you're in Lani Mau Mau. Lani Mau Mau is out the door to the right uh, and down near what Kanu calls the middle school campus. Okay, so Aloha Aina Research with Noel Peralto and friends is at the middle school building. And finally, if you signed up for Mauna Kea Forest Restoration with Uncle Kala Asing and friends, uh, you can meet at the back of the gym. Okay, we'll meet up at the back of the gym for Mauna Kea Forest Restoration with Uncle Kala. Once again, if you don't have a workshop, uh, you can come up to the stage and we will find a wonderful place for you to go. Mahalo, enjoy the workshops.
idea about when one thing becomes another, right? And we're going to be taking a look at and, and challenging this idea. Question for you guys. When does the tree become the forest? After thousands of years of time. After thousands of years, right? It's also a matter of perspective, right? Because the Kanaka, we're down on the ground looking at the tree. Very hard to see the forest, right? When you're standing so close to the tree, hard to see the forest. The eel flying high above doesn't necessarily see the tree, it sees the forest is the accumulation of trees, right? And so perspective becomes very important in stories and storytelling, right? Perspective of the storyteller, perspective of the listener, the person listening to the story, right? Snowbird Bento and Jamaica Osorio did a TED Talk 10 years ago. Uh, it's on YouTube if you're interested. In that TED Talk, uh, they talk about what happens when you tell a story from the perspective of a person that is not normally the center of attention, right? What happens when you do a, we've all seen numerous hula dunk for Pele, what happens when you tell that same story from the perspective of a couple Same story, different perspective, right? And so that was Snowbird's uh, hula in that very monarch for that year. But it brings up an interesting question, right? This idea of perspective. From, from where do you look and where do you see things? One of the stories I'd like to start off, I'm gonna tell a bunch of stories today. And hopefully from these stories that we tell today, you guys can get a larger significance for the importance of stories and the significance of stories. First story I'd like to talk about is Commandment of the Third. In 1845, Kawikeoli. Come on, you guys. Who's the name? Kawikeoli. Oh, that was Oli. Thumbs up to that guy. Right? Commandment of the Third, Kawikeoli, receives some, he's the king of the Hawaiians, son of Commandment of the Great. He receives petitions from various Makai Nana from all over the world. From from all around the Paiaina, all around Hawaii, from Haina, from other places. In these petitions, the Makainan are asking him, Hey, King, why do you have so many foreigners in government? We have too many foreigners in government. We don't want all of these foreigners in government. The little people are going to get eaten. And this is where the Kamakau quote about the small to big fish eating the little fish. Right? All of these foreigners who are ma'a to all of these things that are these new things that are coming, they're going to eat these smaller fish, us, the Makayana, who are not Maha to these things. Right? And so petition, 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 and all of these get sent to Commander the Third. And so that story is a well told story. I've heard that story over and over and over and over again. Right? The Makayana expressing their dislike for foreigners in government. This perspective that I think gets backgrounded, people shine the light on what the Makainan are saying, on this day, I would like to shine that light back onto our chiefs, back onto our people, right? Those who built this country today, okay? If we take a look at that same question, that same situation from the eyes of Commandment the Third, anyone know what his response was? Go ahead. Didn't he say that every child or something like that that was in this island was considered a Kanaka? He 
said, yes, uh, amongst other things, he, he spoke to that effect. What he also said was, I do not have people, Kanaka, who are trained, who are educated in these things. The reason these foreigners are in these positions is because we do not have trained, competent people in those positions. When I have a trained, competent Hawaiian, they will be in that position. For now, we do not. That's why we have the foreigners in these positions. Because they came from lands where they understood international law and treaties and constitutional law and these new ideas. These ideas that we were capable of grasping, we just not, did not have the time to engage with. So until we had that time to engage, we were going to have these foreigners. Right? So from that story, you can identify a different problem depending on which perspective you shine the light on. Are you looking at Kamehameha the thirds? Right? Are you looking at the forests? How do I take care of this country? Not only do I have to take care of all the individual trees, but I've got to take care of this forest and make sure this forest, this country is still here. Right? We cannot lose this country to another invading country, to another enemy. Right? Or do you look at that story from the Hongaina saying, hey, these people are going to get taken out. This big fish is going to come eat this small fish. Right? Both stories valid. Just I have heard one story repeated, 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 and it's become the story. Right? So on Lakuokoa today, I ask, hey, let's look at this through the eyes of Kawaiyoli. What was he facing in the context of that? Right? He's facing gunboat diplomacy. 1839, France comes, wants to take over Hawaii. 1843, Great Britain comes, takes over Hawaii, lowers the Hawaiian flag. Not until Admiral Thomas comes back, Thomas Square, La Ikea. Right? That whole event do we get the return of Hawaiian sovereignty, the Huamau, Heo, Kaini, the the return of sovereignty. Right? So Kaui Keoli is constantly challenged with these mm -hmm. people coming from abroad, coming from afar. Right? So he's that eel in the sky. How do I take care of this country? I have to keep this country together. Right? In order to do that, I need competent Hawaiians. I need educated Hawaiians. Right? So depending on what story you focus on, because the answer to what's the answer to the other story? I don't like foreigners in government. Hawaiians in government, how they go home, right? Do you want a Hawaiian in, the, in that seat or do you want a competent Hawaiian in that seat? Right? And that's that focus on education. And for me, that's the moral of that story, the importance of education, right? Today we're talking about the uh, education. Sorry, I'm wandering out of it. <laughs> And so for me, that story brings back the significance of education, right? the importance of education. Second story, or second question I have for you guys. You guys are a little younger than what I would normally have this debate with, so to speak, but let's let's try, let's go on anyway. You know? How many of you guys have heard the idea that Hawaiians didn't own land? Does that make sense to you, not make sense to you? If I were to force you to make a decision, and I asked you, do you think Hawaiians owned land? Do you think Hawaiians didn't own land? Did own land, raise your hand. Did not own land, raise your hand. More important question is why? Why do we think what we think? Have we heard it? Have we heard someone else tell this story and now we're repeating that story? Or have we thought about this for ourselves? Because under such a simple question are 10 other questions that you subconsciously answer to come up with an answer that we don't realize, right? 
And so this is where a lot of our history needs a whole lot of plot. Right? We've got to bring these things to the surface and peel them back layer by layer. Hawaiian history is built contemporary. State of Hawaii Hawaiian history is built on a three-legged stool. That three-legged stool is a three-legged stool of illegality. The 1887 Bayonet Constitution, the 1893 Illegal Overthrow, and the 1898 Illegal Annexation. What's the common theme for this stool? We we lost something important, illegal, illegal, illegal. In order to make something illegal, legal, you have to tell a very creative story. Very creative stories. And this is where, right, to be clear, the state of Hawaii, the United States of, of America, claims that they lawfully annexed Hawaii and incorporated it in. Right? That would be like AT&T, T-Mobile, they want to come together and create one big phone company. Right? To do that, you have to have a contract that both parties sign. No contract, no marriage, no incorporation. Right? And so in Hawaii, we don't have that lawful coming together. Right? The United States doesn't claim that they took Hawaii by force kicked our butt, and that's why we're the 50th state, they claim lawful transfer, right? So with that lawful transfer, how do you get lawful transfer from illegal, illegal, illegal? And that's where the stories come, right? That's where you have to make a story about Kalakaua being the merry monarch and being this drunk guy and didn't know what he was doing. That's where you have to make a story about the queen going to go and make her own constitution and they had to overthrow her because she was going to make a new constitution. That's to cover up the fact that the constitution that they made was illegal and that the overthrow that they made was illegal. All right? So there's lots of creative stories in Hawaiian history that are told to rationalize or justify this illegal three-legged story. This is why stories are important. This is why you need to understand the old law. This is why you need to understand our history, right? And not necessarily the history that you were told, because the history that you were told is probably wrapped up inside of this three-legged stool of justification, right? And so stories become very, very important. Land, one of the most important stories, right? Land. Papa and Wakea, land, aloha aina, all of these things, Hawaiian identity, tied to land, right? With that significance to Hawaiian identity, with land, we should probably get the land story correct. If we don't get the land story correct, that's going to have serious impact on us as a people because how much it informs our identity probably more than any other relationship, right? Is that relationship to land which shapes our own individual identities. Right? So this land story, very, very, very important. In Hawaii's story by Hawaii's queen, you can Google Hawaii Story by Hawaii's Queen, and you can get a digital version of that entire book on the University of Pennsylvania website. If you do that, you then have full text access, and you can use an edit find, and you can find any word in that book. Right? And so one of the stories that is in that book is a story about Naboth's vineyard. Naboth's vineyard is a biblical story, and Queen Ruby Okalani, as she's driving on a train from lower California through Texas-ish area, that southern area, on her way up to deliver these petitions against annexation, she's sitting on this train and she asks the question, Oh, all you Americans, why are you guys coveting Hawaii, that land way over there, when you have all of this undeveloped land? I look to my right, I look to my left, 
there's nothing but empty land. Why are you coming over the ocean and coveting Naboth's vineyard? Naboth's vineyard is a biblical story. This biblical story is about a king who wanted to buy a vineyard from uh, uh, Makaina, from uh, a farmer. The law of the land at that place was if you inherited a piece of land, you by law could not sell it. If you inherited a piece of land, you could not by law sell it. So Naboth had inherited this land from one of his ancestors. As such, when King Ahab came to him and said, hey, I would like to buy your land. King Ahab, Naboth tells King Ahab, I'm sorry King, I cannot sell it to you. It's against the law. Right? King Ahab goes home, he's de dejected, head hanging low, and his wife, Jezebel, says, I thought you were a king. You cannot get a piece of land from a lowly peasant. She then goes on to make up stories about uh, about Naboth. And those stories uh, result in Naboth's unjustified persecution. Naboth is put to death using the legal system, right? With trumped up charges. Charges that aren't true, charges that Jezebel made. At the death of Naboth, King Ahab gets Naboth's vineyard. Right? And Lilibu invokes this story to talk about Hawaii. Why do you guys claim those lands way over there, this vineyard, Hawaii, that you want for yourselves that you can't have? Why can't you have it? Because you tried to incorporate Hawaii into America two times, once in 1893, another time in 1898, both times that failed. And you still want Hawaii. Why do you claim that vineyard so far away? Right? And so in that story, she's talking about Hawaii as that vineyard. Right? In a more specific instance, this story is directly related to the crown lands. Right? The crown lands make up 25% of Hawaii. Originally, they were called the king's lands. You also had a bunch of land that were, went to the government, and then you had a bunch of land that went to the Kuanahi. These are our Aliki Trust, Kamehameha Schools, Queen Emma, Queen's Hospital, Lunalila Homes, etc. Right? This is the king or the crown lands. That large portion of the lands... <coughs> Sorry, I'm horrible to film. <laughs> I wonder. That portion, that one-third of the pie, one million acres of Hawaii, is Naboth's vineyard. Why? In 1865, those lands were made inalienable. Inalienable means you cannot sell, right? The piece of the pie was this big. Kamehameha III sold some, Kamehameha IV sold some, Kamehameha V, Lot Kapuai becomes into power and says, if we continue this trend of selling these lands, they're all going to be gone. He goes to the, to the legislature and says, can you make these lands inalienable, unavailable for sale? So since 1865, that portion of the land was inalienable, unavailable for sale. Between 1865 and 1893, time of the overthrow, those lands are leased by sugar, almost in its entirety. 900 plus thousand acres are leased by sugar. Right? Sugar wants to buy these lands. Can they buy these lands? No, they're made inalienable. And this is where those lands are in the boss vineyards. It's that land which cannot be sold, but something that somebody with a lot of power covets. Right? Why do you covet those lands way over there? Why do you covet the crown lands? Well, because we have all of our sugar plantations on them. Right? That is the major impetus for the overthrow of the government. That section of land here, the crown lands, is coveted by multiple different entities. One, the United States of America. Two, the sugar planters. Three, Sanford Dole. 
Sanford Dole wants those lands for homesteads. There are different kinds of homesteads in Hawaiian history. There are homesteads during the Hawaiian Kingdom era, which were trying to put Hawaiian nationals on land. There are homesteads right after the overthrow that are trying to put Americans on land. And then you have 1920 Hawaiian homelands, homesteads. Right? So you have three different genealogies of home, home, uh, homestead, homesteads in Hawaiian history. The military wants these lands for bases. Why? Because they're empty on Hua. Since 1865, you could not sell them. So nobody went and said, oh, I'd like that farm lot in the middle of that one on Hua. So if I want to put up a military base, I don't have to buy any farmers out. All of the crown lands are empty, vacant lands because since 1865, they were made in Asia. So you have these three different entities. <coughs> Sanford Do, Homesteads, Sugar planters want their sugar plantations because that's the land they're leasing and they want to then buy those lands and then the United States military. The majority of our military bases today are on crop lands. Okay. Kahawiki, Fort Shafter, uh, Schofield Barracks, Wainaiuka, crown lands. Bellows Air Force Base, Waimanalo, crown lands. You name your military base, for the most part, it's on crown lands. Why? Because it was that big section that could not be sold that was empty for 30 plus years. So you have these three entities who covet this land, this aina, right? And from that coveting, they go through illegal means, the illegal overthrow, the illegal annexation, and they overthrow the government. In the 1894 constitution, Article 95, they confiscate those lands, right? That would be like us today confiscating Trump Plaza from Donald Trump while he was president. Those were Donald Trump's private lands, not the White House, which belongs to the citizenry of the United States, right? So they took Trump Plaza and they said, hmm, you were president. That makes them public property. Therefore, we're going to confiscate it and treat it as if it's public property. Language. Pen. Power of the pen. They took a million acres from who at that time was the queen through the stroke of a pen. The importance of language. In that article, they rename and they say that portion of the public lands. They were never public, they were always private. But they renamed them so that you could confiscate them. Because in American Constitution, you cannot take private property without compensation. Right? If I need to, if the government wants to build a road, they need to give you compensation for the property for you to build that road. Right? So my worry is that if we don't know these stories, If we don't imagine 10 years ago, your family had a, a thousand head of cattle. And 10 years ago, that thousand head of cattle stole it. 10 years later, you're hungry. Cattle gone, hungry. Pretend I stole your cattle. Now I come in and start giving you hamburger. Guess what I'm feeding you? Your own cow. And we're going to eat up that hamburger because we're hungry. And we don't know the story of that theft and how that theft and how that thing happened. Right? And this is the crown lands. Right? And it's going to happen through various mechanisms. Because if I am them, I am going to hand the bag off to somebody else. I'm not going to hold on to this bag, this stolen property. I'm going to sell it to someone else and let the two of you work it out. All right? Let the Hawaiians argue with Hawaiians over who gets that land. And then the guy who stole the land in the first place He's on vacation in the Bahamas. Well, the Hawaiian
Hawaiians over here fighting with other Hawaiians because they handed off the bag. Right? And so for me, this is the importance of stories. I don't want to eat my own story. I don't want to eat my neighbor's stolen cattle. Give that back to my neighbor, that's not mine. That belongs to my neighbor, right? And so for me, this is the importance of stories. The importance of genealogy, being able to trace these stories. Where did these ideas come from, right? Where do we get this idea, Hawaiians didn't own land? Where do we get, I want nothing more than Hawaiians to believe that Hawaiians didn't own land. Monokia is not yours. Thank you, it's mine. That line is not yours. Thank you, it's mine. Okay. And so this is where I, I go back to... She likes to think about the edges where things fill into each other and become their opposites. Right? For me, Hawaiians own land. I think Hawaiians own land differently than Europeans and Americans own land. But I don't give away the concept of ownership. Because if I give away that entire concept of ownership, I gave the idea away and I gave the land away, in my mind. And then I have to fight back to own something I already own. If I already own it, I'm already here. Why am I going to give up ownership to fight to get back to this level? Okay. 1840, Kamehameha, Kamehameha III, Kawikiobi, raised the Maka'e Nana to the level of land managers. Never in Hawaiian history were the Maka'e Nana ma land managers before 1840, before the 1839 Declaration of Rights, before the 1840 Constitution. For me, this could possibly be a manifestation of Kapihe's goal. Kapihe is a prophet from Kamehameha at the time. First time, he says, that which is above will fall, that which is below will rise. The Maka'i Nana rising to the level of land manager for me is a manifestation of that. For the first time in Hawaiian history, Maka'i Nana are land managers. If I go back to the petition story, are we trained to be land managers? Right? Because for the first time in our history, in 1840, that Maka, first Maka'i Nana generation for the first time had the kuleana of land management. Never before were they tasked with that kuleana. Are our people trained no. for that kuleana? No. All right. Or we can focus on the other side of the question and say, how they right. I don't control who comes and who stays in a body. I do control if I'm prepared or if I'm not prepared. If I train myself to learn how to manage land or don't train myself how to manage that. But in 1840, the Makayanana class raised to that level, the first time in our history. And that was Kawikeo, taking care of his people, right? Because he knew all the Ali'i were dying, right? You can effectively say many of the Ali'i lines died out, right? Bernice Pawai Bishop, Kamehameha Schools, last of the Kamehameha line. Right? Many of the Ili'i genealogies died out. And that was that huge depopulation that was happening during that time. I'm going to end there, but I'd like to leave you with the importance of stories. Stories you tell, stories you hear, and what's the genealogy of those stories? Where do those stories come from? Okay. Questions? Where are we on time? 11 o'clock is called? Or? Mm -hmm. Oh, this is Okay, so we got five minutes for questions. Come on. So, in your first story, Kaui Kiwi, was, was that the Kamehameha you were talking about that had all the foreign advisors yep. on his board? So he knew, right? Because you, you were saying that like he wouldn't have put Hawaiians into the, they were competent. 
to run the government or be a part of that governing system. But then he raised the Mafaimana up without training them to be land owners or like it, did, did something happen after the Mafaimana rose? Like were they responsible enough? Did they have that mindset to manage that land or did land was that another way of our land exiting the hands of Hawaii? I think that would be, I, I know you're not necessarily presenting it as a criticism, but I think that would be a fair criticism of that action, yeah. right? Because you're going to raise the people and then they're not trained. Yeah. So, I know. I was just and then yeah. what happens if without training then they start selling and, yeah. and, and that kind of thing, right? Um, the, the, the biggest thing I think affecting the Hawaiian Many people look at the mahele as the thing that separated Hawaiian society. That's the thing that got in between the chiefs and the makainana. That's the thing that got separated people from the land. Right? For me, that already happened. That was the population that did that. Right? If you go from 400,000 Hawaiians to 80,000 Hawaiians, that's one-fifth of the population. Right? So if we, for easy math, if we say there's a thousand Angkwa, 400,000 divided by 1,000, that's 400 people on average per Agua. That 400 goes down to 80. Mm -hmm. So now 80 people have to do the work of 400. Not going to happen, right? It's not going to happen while sustaining that <coughs> system and all of, all of that. But, so for me, depopulation, but it's difficult to get a PhD with depopulation. Right? It, there's nothing unique about that. There's nothing. Right? Where's the PhD? It happened, right? So I think a lot of us have ignored that fact. Of, I don't know how many Hawaiians were subsistence farming when you have that much population decline. How much of the normal system, we treat it as if it was normal status quo and everybody's farming the land even though you got one-fifth the people, which is not the reality because everybody's leaving to the port towns. Everybody's going to Hilo, everybody's going to Lahaina. So if you have 10,000 people in Honolulu, those 10,000 people, 80 people had to come, 80, 80, 80, until you get 10,000, how many of them are vacant? to get 10,000 people in Honolulu and 5,000 in Lahaina and 3,000 in Hilo, right? So the lands are vacant because of that. So for me, that's what separated the people from the land was there just wasn't enough people through depopulation. But others say, no, it was the Mahele. And that's where we get the Mahele is bad and the Mahele yeah. dispossessed and the Mahele separated the people from the land. I think the population but the is changing in the time too. Right? It's like this generation may not want to run their parents' business, right? Like so similar things like just the I guess rise like, of cattle would be one of the biggest, right? Mm -hmm. um, Kamehameha Vancouver brings cattle. They're roaming free on the government lands. Paniolo come in, right? And you get Paniolo culture, um, and that brings its own unique set of problems, right? Because if you're, and this was a real thing, in 1846, there's a law that says your cow has the right to pasture. I have a right to subsistence gather. What happens when your cow eats the thing I'm subsistence gathering? And so in 1846, that was in the laws. Then in 1850, in the Fuleon Act, that was removed. Many people look at that as Makainana losing rights, I look at that as that's kind of common sense if it's going to be between your cow and me and me a human. Right? There's if I can go gather the thatch and your cow ate all the thatch, who who has right? To. Who has right? They both do and now the call cow is Trump's human. Right? I, I know it's pro probably blasphemous to say in Waimea in cowboy country, but like that, mm -hmm. that is the context for some of these things. And that's a real, but like we, we always look at things like that through this lens of loss, where it's, there's, 
other perspectives that can explain those things too. Right? Like, so it's perspective is really, really important when you're looking at Hawaii history. And if at the time that people were not on the land, right, and they were in the cities, then it didn't mean as much. There was a law in the books. Section 4 of the Kuleana Act says all of those people who do not have land, you may go to the government, which is 50% of Hawaii. You can go to the government and buy lots from 1 to 50 acres at a minimum price of 50 cents per acre. The inflation on that is 20 bucks, right? 50 cents in 1846 is 20 bucks today. Where's that deal? <laughs> Can I get that? Can I, I'll, I'll pay a hundred, I'll pay ten times that, I'll pay a hundred times that, right? I'll pay two grand for a lot, for a 50 cents an acre equivalent lot, right? But for me, that part of it shows that government, getting back to the importance of law, that government was trying to get people on the land. The government that replaced it was not, right? And so for me, for some people, the thing that created this reality that we all live in today was a loss of land. That's not my perspective. The thing for me that created this reality is the loss of governance. 1893 created this reality where we have to fight so hard to make our own schools and to make laws that get people on the land Right? We can't even get them off the waiting list, never mind in 2023, right? So that loss of land versus loss of governance for me is a very important question. For me, this is loss of governance. If we had our government back, we could fix a lot of these things. Others focus on loss of land and want land back. And we want to reclaim land because for them I'm not disagreeing with that just saying if you're not in control of your own land you're still paying property taxes that you can't afford when Bette Midler moves in next to you and all of these other kinds of things and zoning laws and all of these things that governance and sovereignty cover right so for me on Lako Okoa Significance is governance, country, independence. Because from that, you get your language, you get your land, you get your other things. If we were in control of governance, we could bring that, at a minimum price of 50 cents per acre, law back. What would stop us? If we're in control of governance, then we control our stories. We control the stories. We become the storyteller again. Success. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, following up on what was asked, so there was a population, there was this whole idea of the rat race, right? Make money instead of make food or take care of Ohana. People moved into ports or in jobs and waiting and things like that. Um, and population disease happening. When you say that the Maha Ainana now were managers, that's the idea under the Mahana that you have title or you get to decide what happens to this land. But then you mentioned about those government plans. Two, a two-part question. What happened to the Konohiki then? It's a Maha Inanna now we're raised to be, to have that. What was the role of the Konohiki? And second, who took, who were the authors who took most advantage of those government plans? Was it in commerce or was it? Let me get to the first question and then I'll ask you the second one again because I've already forgotten it in my old age. Uh, <coughs> The Konohikis were the biggest losers, so to speak, in the Mahele, right? They lost their free labor, right? Now, they're still land managers. They own all of their land and can pass it down to whomever they wish. But now they have to participate in the more capitalistic labor in exchange for cash exchange rather than land in exchange for service exchange from before so if anything they lost if anyone lost that's that's where the konohiki dropped 
and the Makayanana raised and that which is above will fall and that which is, right? And that's also expressed in the laws where now all of a sudden in the 1839 Declaration of Rights, 1840 Constitution, now all of a sudden you, we will not pass laws for the benefit of one class of people, right? The Konohiki will not benefit, they don't trump the Makainana anymore. And you see this loaded word today, but I'll just use it quickly for now. You see this equality in law where these laws, we're not gonna make something to benefit one class of people. Whereas 18, the Constitution of 1894 was designed to benefit one class of people. We are excluding the Chinese, we are excluding the Japanese, we're making language requirements, you have to speak English or Hawaiian to exclude the Japanese and the Chinese so that the Anglo-Saxons benefit. Because Hawaiians are dying, they're not worried about us. All the Japanese and all the Chinese that are born are all nationals and are all citizens by birth on the country. So they are the de demographic majority. They're not worried about the Hawaiians. We go from 80,000 in 1850 to 40,000 in 1890. Population cuts in half. In 40 years, in my lifetime, half the people of Hawaii are alive. Right? So we're on a very steep downward trend. Right? So that, for me, is the difference between the American government and between the 1894 Constitution and the Hawaiian Kingdom Constitution. Hawaiian Kingdom Constitutions, like, hey, this is not to benefit any specific en entity. 1894, this is to benefit this small group of guys. And that's the large landowner reality we live in today, where this small group of guys own all of Hawaii and control government. Right? That wasn't the case. In 1850, you can buy land from the government. They're not trying to like, if Kamehameha was trying, he could have owned all 4.2 million acres, why does he make a declaration that says there are but three classes of persons having rights in land, first the government, second the chiefs, third the people? Why acknowledge the rights of the people if you're trying to dispossess the people? It doesn't make sense, right? If I were trying to dispossess and not to get lands in the hands of Hawaiians, I would not have made that law, right? That 1839 Declaration of Rights is that liberation of the Makainana class. You gotta tell them stop asking Sorry. questions. <laughs> <laughs> He's just so I was Paul five minutes ago, but I'm kidding. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. I will stop it there. If you still have questions, come and talk story with me and I can I can wow.
Um, and I'm not here to convince you of anything. That is not my that is not my mission. You are free thinkers. I do not want to capture anybody's mind. You take the information and use it if you want to. Put it on the side if you don't want to use it. Or if you're not ready to. I mean it's up to you how you wanna how you want to use the information. And that's all I have. And I say Ike and don't say Manalo. I always have an opinion. Uh, what I give you today is Ike. The reason is a lot of this stuff is written. It's just that we don't know that it's there. So, my first question is, and I want you guys to not that stuff. Who are you? I'm not talking about Camilo Kamuna. But who are you? Okay. Who are you? We look at this, it's a beautiful school. It's a beautiful wow, it's like awesome. Remind me of when I was growing up in Hawaii, we had small little wooden wooden classes, but we had big fields. You know, it was wide open. Today it's like oh horrible school is right. You know, little town. Why you come in and so why does it matter to you? You guys saw me this morning. Very emotional. So who are you? And that's the essence of what I want to you know, give to you. That's who are you. So you don't answer questions. What's up? But it is, right? How do we identify ourselves? Like me, I'm not saying Moku, I say Napoku. Because that's what we're known as. There's a place over there, lots of people call Pailoko. But it's not Pailoko, it's Peiloko. And my kupuna say Peiloko. Even though the person that calls it Payoko is not for me. And we know. So I fight for the identity all the time. So what I'm here for is to discover who we are. Who are you? Pictures. I just don't know if you can see. And I said, Who are we? Who are we as a people? Who are we? This is what it's all about, this school, right? The king come here to find out what the culture, the language. So, who are we then? Why is this so important? Why not always full? God has been in the in this school is like overwhelming for me. You guys don't realize. You know, to know that you guys have all this ability to learn this, who are we? And it's within these walls, within these grounds. Each and every day that you come here, you speak the language. I'm a second generation of our people that lost that ability. I only know English, Pelekunia. A little Hawaii, a little, very little. And I've learned that only because I delve into this. And because the people that I learn from are able to speak the language. And for me to hear a language, to not take it for granted, because it is who you are, the a little that you speak, is old from our people before we come in. Yeah. So it's important. So now, how many of you are Kanakamau? Is How many of you are Native Hawaiian? Okay. Are they the same? So I speak of an identity. Are they the same? You don't have to answer the question. Are they the same? Or contemplation? Or is there a difference? Is there a difference? Put that into your head. When I, when I went on this journey, there was a reason why I came to this. And it was challenges with, as you guys know, we do the old law. It was challenges I was making against the county of Maui, the director of finance, 
and a lot about real property tax. It started with the story I told you about when we went to County Council and OHA came with their presentation. We went to the presentation, everybody, all the Kanakas in the room, they're like, yeah, you know, we want this, we want this, $150. Because you got to figure, say, and a lot of you don't know, you guys, Kupuna, you was being bombarded by some things that was $50,000. How many of you get $50,000 in there? Yeah. We get $5,000. I don't know. I got Benny, but we Benny and a bunch of people. Maybe taxes. But the thing is, so I was looking at us, you know what I mean? Luckily, you know, my my Makua, they was paying. But still yet, I was thinking like, you know, oh, what is all this? You know, and I was getting into the stuff, so when we went to Oa, I was going to read, you know, we put make a kind of bike, was learning this stuff, I was going to like, no, I I insisted and paid after it. That was fun. So why am I here getting an offer from you guys to charge us taxes? So my whole thing was, why are you charging me taxes? Show me that you can you can make me pay taxes. So they came with the exemption. Right? So because of the old law, old law said that all commutations are paid. There was nothing owing on the property. So when I presented that, well, it's funny because one of the guys from Ana, a council member said, oh, the Mr. Kamala is saying too, and are we breaking the law? And everybody else is out of the room. He asked the court counsel, court counsel is the lawyers for the for the company. She said, and this is what her words. And you guys see them on the slides. It's an old law. Right? And he talked about the old law. It's an old law. That that resonated to all nine council members. And they made it mark, I mean they're like they got spin because they Oh, all of a sudden, they got a, I came up with a law. I came up with our law. I came up with what was actually real, and they had to uphold it. So all nine of them had to say yes. They were forced to. There was no question because they couldn't break the law. The Hanoi representative, are we breaking the law? So they all went. And when the lawyer said, yeah, basically what you're doing, if you ask me for money. So our exemption is just an exemption, which all islands have. Our exemption was zero. So we applied for that tax exemption, we get zero. We're the only ones in Ireland because we bought them all for it. Not even the judge, because there's Judge Mossman who was actually doing the thing. He was a representative on the thing. And they was asking me questions. I don't know, this is the first time this thing ever came up. I have no idea what he's talking about. They bought a lawyer from home. I said, I have nothing to say. Because they all knew. Is there a difference? Is there a difference? Who are you? Does it really matter what you call yourselves? So how many lawyers we get in this room? Oh, oh okay. <laughs> you don't come. <laughs> you don't rebel. You don't come. <laughs> so, you know, I know a lawyer. Uh, my is not one, I mean, uh, uh, she's not one, I don't know, she's one, no kids. So you don't understand. But is there a difference? And why do we know there's no difference? When, how many of you ever went to a court case? Good fun, you know. Kind of good fun, I listen to it. Oh, but what is it? Oh, that's a lie. And they see how they maneuver everything. They just go and sit there. You know, they bring up all their stuff and witnesses. And, you know, you know in yourself, that is a lie. But what are they saying? So they use terminologies. They use terminologies to catch you, to find you. This is one of them. So anybody want, could read this for us? Um, 42 U.S. Chapter 122, Native Hawaiian Health Care. Fancy symbol that I don't know what it means. Section, thank you. 11, 7, 11, definitions. Number three, Native Hawaiian. The term Native Hawaiian means any individual who is a, a citizen of the United States. Okay. How many, how many people remember Anani 
future. Also, famous thing is we are America. What does it say? Okay. So, definition. So, USC that you see up there is United States Code. Well, it's not a law, it's a code. Okay. Chapter 122. Under the Native Hawaiian Healthcare. Subsection. So, you see it saying subsection? Uh, 11, 7, 11. Definition. Okay? So I want you to read, I, I'm just going to read the highlighted. So can you read the highlighted area on the bottom? Kamaina long-term community residence verification for birth records of the state of Hawaii. Okay. Does that ring an alarm? Anybody? Look at what it says now. You guys know what Kamaina is, yeah? And they define what Kamaina in the parentheses. This is what they, they say. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Huh? But they use the word Native Hawaiian loosely. Oh, Native Hawaiian water rights. So that means Mr. Texas, the Justin Movie, five years ago, he get my rights? No, he get the Native Hawaiian rights. They wanted to push it, right? And <laughs> not even not even United States citizen changes. They could actually ask for this. They could get this as it states. Doesn't say exactly who a long community resident is. It just says, right? Long term community resident. It doesn't even say what long term means. So long term can be what? Oh, I just got here. Ten minutes later, is that long enough? Fifteen minutes later, ten years later, one year later. As soon as I close my eyes in my long-term resident, I landed here and they got my property. Don't know. It doesn't define it. So when you go to court, it's important on terminologies. You want to go this route? You want to be in this fight? You better understand what the American is. You better understand what you're getting involved in and who you're talking about. Because you know I get plenty of educators. Okay? And I learned this on my own. Because I was forced to. And sad to say, this word, Native Hawaiian, is used loosely. They even give a Native Hawaiian law book. But do they realize that they're talking to every Tom, Dick, and Harry that came here? I get nothing against people coming. I get nothing against anybody. But, again, who are you? I'm out. Point. Does it matter? Yeah? Gotta think because these lawyers, they know these things. Oh, you think they use them? They like, oh, to catch you. This is another one. Okay, everybody, right? We, um, 2014, who comes to Hawaii? What, what government body comes to Hawaii? Huh? Why would not be interior? Why did they come? They wanted to set up the entity they're going to save. Everybody say it. They gave it to save the Native Hawaiian. Who are the Native Hawaiians? <laughs> United States citizens. Come on. Hey, does this mean that they have to be one United States citizen? Even? To be considered a Native Hawaiian? Question. Does it have to be all those things or just one of them? No, it's got to be one of them. Hey, cut them yeah. A and B. That's the five conditional. Well, it's... It, to me, this is the most important of all the definitions, right? But they like enchant us with this right here. We say it's on average. You guys even know what Aboriginal means? Do you guys understand what Aboriginal means? So if you look at the Greek form, AB means not part of or separated. 
So that question, as in Aboriginal people, use loosely too. Oh yeah, we Aboriginal. You may not be the original. Abnormal, absent, right? Indigenous is on all of it. Well, yeah, we Indigenous. Did you read the very bottom where it says in Indigenous? It says people that are actually dominated by a foreigner. We celebrate La Cucua. What is it about? Say hello. Independence. How are you going to be independent? You're dominated by a foreign, foreign entity. Terminologies. Understand. Wording makes difference because it puts you into slots. And they want you to be in this slot. Why? Because they control the outcome. Yeah, we need a voice. Aboriginal, indigenous. See, the only reason I went this way, the reason why I went this way, is because when I went and to the real property tax, I wrote a letter to the to the department of of uh, uh, the director of finance. I said I went, I did the money, I stuff, I went, give all this background, everything, all the stuff. He couldn't answer, so he sent them to court counsel. Co counsel answered me and said, Well, because I wanted to know, oh, I'd like to see where my obligation to pay taxes on property and I want to see the county's interest to my Kuliama. I want to see where do you attach, because this thing came from 18 when? 46 around there. Oh, Maui County was around there. Oh, where, where, where you guys? I don't see. You're not in my genealogy. And they walk around related to the Maui County. They're really to my kupuna in my bar, I don't see that. So I'm a question. He comes back to tell me, oh, we don't have no, we don't claim no interest in your property. I say, hey, but you're making me pay taxes. See if you don't know, right? But if you don't ask the question, there's never a dumb question. It's always foolish not to ask a question that you, people may think, ah, it's not a dumb question. You know the answer, really. Did you know the answer? How many of you know that they don't actually make on interest claim on your properties? So then, huh? So about the very bottom said, but you are a United States citizen. Because why? I'm a native Hawaiian. So because you're a United States citizen, native Hawaiian, I can charge you taxes. We have that power. I mean, okay. I'm gonna find out from a native Hawaiian. Then. I'm gonna find out from a United States citizen. Then. So who do I write to? So luckily I had a friend work, I used to work for the jail, I worked for the jail for 28 years. Um, and one of my friends was heavy to this thing too, so he said, oh come, you know, put inside, you know, you can get exemption from, from the income tax. Oh, they do that. I just put inside and tell me, you know, this is, you know, you don't need it fine. I haven't already been at the tax. Oh, cool, you can do that. Put him inside, comes back, refused. I said, brother, they refused. He said, no, they cannot. You got to put them back. Put them back inside. And on the very box, I took my W form. I wait for my exemption, I put down there, I'm a native Hawaiian, I live in my own country, and it's, you know, this, so, wow, one whole year, it's like 2011, I think I put it in. So beginning of 2012, my first picture, I look, oh, no more any withholding. They never withhold federal tax, they never withhold state taxes. I don't have a full picture, I just, I'm good. You know, this is great. That's what like, and so, I went through right there. What the guy said, the lawyer said, what am I? I'm on I'm a United States citizen. Oh God. How many United States citizens gonna check like this? I wanna see. And I I went, I went, see you ask that. I mean I went, I went, keep on I got my teacher forward. I sent for taxi. I'll get that for three months, that's three years over there. I'm a full pay check. I had the I had the I had the treasury department write to me. They say, oh, we want to we wanna talk to you, we want to have a meeting with you, we want to see if you, this word they like to use is frivolous. Anybody know what frivolous means? Like, it's like, eh, you know what I mean, oh, are you really telling the truth or are you just making this up? Are they really telling the truth or are they making this up? Is this frivolous? So I said, frivolous, I said, whatever. Call me up six o'clock and say, I give an hour. The IRS took my papers and they sent them to the Treasury Department. So I was getting called by the feds because of the paper. I said everything I had 
on income tax because they were still, they wanted to hit me with a previous tax before I got my exemption. So I wrote all this stuff and put down all this, all the information I would gather, all of it, just send them to them. They went, they didn't know, to, they send them to the, they send them to the Treasury Department. The Treasury Department sent me a letter and said, oh, we got to investigate this, if you've been frivolous, if you are so, we're going to penalize you, we're going to do this, we can take away your house, we can do all this kind of stuff. Because I already knew. I already knew. And well, I was right. And I was really messed up. So the thing is, what happens? Come back, you're interviewed from the, from the agent. This lady called me up and she said, What makes you believe that you are, you know, you know, you're a citizen? So I said, Oh, okay. I said, It's uh, um, 1993, um, the apology book. Yeah? If you don't know what that is, please go look it up. People say, oh, that's a, no, it's not worth well, it. It is. There is. I'm not saying that it's you know anything, but it's the thing about it has a wealth of information. Wealth of information that a lot of us don't even know. And we take for granted. Like the overthrow. They say, oh yeah, I had Tanaka. Shall I go read the first statement inside that apology bill? It says, no, no citizen of uh, the Hawaii Kingdom was involved in the overthrow. You see? How many of you guys know? But anyway, I sent that paper, I highlighted whereas 28 of you was. Because what does it say? That the Hawaiians never gave up what? What did we give up? Sovereignty over our land? What else did we give? Up? We never give up anything. Yeah. We were still so I mean, we still sovereign. We never give up the sovereignty. We never give up our lands. We never give up nothing. So I told her, she said, oh, I don't see it. I said, no, see my packet. She pulled them out, big balls. Come back, oh, I don't know that. <laughs> oh, that's not my fault. That's not my problem, that's no problem. After that, it was like, conversation over. She said, okay, so even if you're not an American citizen, you still got to pay taxes. You live in America, I said, what does that work? You just said, I know I'm an American citizen. Then that means the land I stand in on my birth was well, Hanau. Oh, I shouldn't say that because actually I was. And I'm actually from, I'm actually from uh, New Jersey. My father was in the Korean War, so he traveled. And we, uh, I was one of the last siblings. Uh, I actually have three that were born on Oahu, but I actually was born in New Jersey. I'm making this clear. I can't lose it. But not a bad thing, Dad. <laughs> lucky for me, I came back home and I found my home. So, um, so the thing is, I'm gonna. <laughs> that just sent me on, and I started looking up all this stuff on, on things. And then I went and I came upon these things. So these are the things important for you to read and understand what they're saying about you. Because who are you? They get this one too. Oh, you remember that the DOI we go back? So the DOI, they wanted to make us Indians. There was, there's been meetings going on for the last two years in Vegas. And I haven't mentioned the name because I truly disagree with it. You guys may be good, whatever. But I disagree. I'm not saying I hate it. I don't hate it. I may not like the work you do. I may not agree with it. But I don't hate it. Hate is very strong. You know, and that brings up other things, other issues. But I dislike what she does, Robin Dan. She's been meeting with Shaw. They've been meeting with people of the United States, the Feds, for three years. Moving into this. Okay. So in 2014, that's what they came here, the entity, they wanted to do, again, that recognition. A couple bill. Our group did one thing on that couple bill. And why it's so wrong. But the whole thing is, they wanted to make us Indians. So how does that work out for the United States? Well, one thing, they still have a treaty with us. Anybody know what treaty they have with us? Nobody knows that they still have a treaty. That's why they can do business here. They have, a, they have a treaty of commerce that started in a kingdom that was never, never dissolved. 
because they couldn't. That was their time. So everything they're doing here is commerce. No treaty of annexation. You can go look that up. You can go search it in the, the United States archives. You'll never find a treaty of annexation. And I'll tell you, I got metal. The only treaty they have is treaty of commerce. Even with the Republic of Hawaii, they put out a treaty, but it was never, ever um, ratified. They have it in that in that uh, national library, but it's not ratified. It was never ratified. Couldn't. And that's another story. But they wanted to make us Indians. What's wrong with that? For one thing, American Indians don't call themselves American Indians. To be polite and correct, they are Turtle Islanders. America to them is Turtle Island. All the north of America. They call themselves Turtle Islanders. And then they have their different tribes. Okay, so like we, well, we want to, if we want to be called correctly who we are, then we should respect those people they are not American Indians. They do not call themselves that. They call them by their tribal names and they recognize themselves as Turtle Islanders. Yeah. So they wanted us. So why is that helpful to me? Then they can take all the money. They don't have to give OHA anything. Because right now, OHA accepts a lot of money from that treaty. You get all money over it. OHA is holding on. OHA is a state entity. So they're still using our money. But that's ours. But as a native Hawaiian, they can control it. So the thing is, don't they like trust with the Indians? Why? Oh, they didn't know what to do, not this. But that's, that's, that's wrong. You know, plenty of guys want the recognition. Well, we're going to get money. I told them, you guys got to go look. I said, what you're doing is you're imposing on these people. And if you guys never see, there's a film called, um, it's on, um, uh, uh, Doctrine of Discovery. The thing is called uh, Mask of, of uh, Domination. Uh, you guys got to look at that one. Because those people deserve what they get. And we shouldn't be a part of taking what is theirs. Because those people were massacred. I mean, ruthless. You don't know the history of the Turtle Islanders? Go look at that. Doctrine of discovery, mask of domination. It's a sad thing. You know, Christ did a movie. Um, so, real quick, I don't want to, you know, this is all the same thing. You guys like to come down for your notes. Know, so it's just saying the same thing over and over. But, <coughs> you know, when I talk to a lot of non Hawaiians too, so I kind of, they like, they see this, they're like, oh, wow, yeah. Oh, we never know that. So, pursuant to my kingdom law, 1846, Okuna 5, Okuna, Okuna, you guys can read that better than I can. It says, brother, uh, can you read what it says? Uh, one, the term Kanaka Maoli is used to differentiate and distinguish a native subject from aliens and or denizens residing in the kingdom of the Hawaiian Islands. Okay, so they wrote them. So, does it make a difference? Kanaka Maoli. Native Hawaiian. Here's the answer from your ancestors. They wanted to differentiate themselves from those entities. So it was important. Everybody wants to go. I mean, you know, if you want to use Hawaiian National, you want to use what else? But those are all English terms. They come along with English ties. Go well, back to what it says. Who are we? Everybody, who are we? Kanaka Maori. Our people say this is who we are. We differ from everybody else that lives in our islands. Why do we use Hawaiian nationals? Why are we using Native Hawaiian? Why are we using these, these terminologies? Why are we letting these foreigners tell us who we are? When our Kanaka, when our Kupuna said, this is us. This is us. We come from Kohawai Pai Aina. We kick your kaina. We is Kanaka Maori. No other words should come up in your mouth. Kanaka Maori. Yeah. 
This is important. This is good for you guys. This is this is the Olelo Hawaii. Kind of like the one I was talking about. This is what he first it tells you exactly. So in Hawaii they had they had Kanaka Kanaka Maui, the native, the two native. Kanaka Hawaii, those that were were um, naturalized. Or, you don't realize we naturalized. We were uh, uh, naturalizing people since 18, the 1800s. But they had to, and this is the law. This is how they described themselves. There was nothing to be prejudiced about, but because there were certain things that only belonged to the Kanaka Maui. Right, so I go to like Washington, and I go over there and find out, oh, you know, the natives over there, they get all these rights. But then you get the residents, they get their rights too. And then you come in as a visitor, you get certain rights, but not as much as the other guys. This is what it's saying, it's the, that's the purpose of the thing. Because something is just kamaka Maori. Yeah. Can I take a picture of this? Yeah. yeah. So like I said, all the stuff I give is ike. It's not, it's not opinion. It's stuff that is actually wicked that you can research on your own. And this was for my research. This is just the English part, the translation. You know, I think this was it. So like even for people that, like for me who born abroad, I my Honor. Honor. Where are you going? So these three men play an important part in the discussion. Uh, in, 19, in the 1900s, uh, this is after they were trying to annex it, Hawaii. Um, they were trying to define citizens of the Republic of Hawaii. So at this time, this is 1900, so we're talking about the Republic of Hawaii, right? And so they had in their discussions, they had to determine who on August 12, 1898, were citizens of the public. Yeah, this is this is just from from, uh, from their debate. So basically I desire uh, I love this guy. Uh, I desire to ask the senators party new forgotten the provision of the constitution of Hawaii on the subject at the extent of citizen under the Republic were all inhabitants citizens. It's a very important point. We're all them citizens. This is the guy representing Hawaii, wanted to annex Hawaii uh, uh, to, to say that everybody was in Caesar. So they're asking him if he's a representative for the Republic of Hawaii. And he answers, no, sir. There are a class of citizens existing on the Republic who declined to take the oath of allegiance. Who was that? Quay petition is that record. If you guys don't, if you guys don't hear the Quay petition, you need to have, you need to understand how important, and I cannot say any more to you as a Kanaka Maori. Those people spoke, and because they spoke, they discussed, you know what I mean? Congress, this is Congress. They talking about it. So we, they knew when it came 18, uh, 1897, when that Kui petition came out. So that's why they're asking this question. Oh, okay, who, who, who are we considering your guys citizens? So they said there was a class of people. Mr. Mm -hmm. Big, the senator will see the pertinency of the inquiry when that part of the section is taken in connection with the amendment to which the conference have agreed. Because if they were not citizens of Hawaii August 12, 1898, they are not now under this bill made either citizens of the United States or citizens of the territory of Hawaii. So who are you? Everybody? Come on. Important. These are the words. And so Mr. Spooner said, and he could not become citizen of the United States except by naturalization. And I do not know that they could by naturalization under existing law. Okay. 
Okay, so that day they were already saying, Oh, I'm not going to allow us to do this. But they do, you know, under what guise? Under what guise are they, you know, are they doing this? Native Hawaiian. It's detrimental. It's like taking poison every day, every day. You say it, you're taking poison because you're killing yourself. The missions that, check them out. So it says, especially subsection 19, okay? The missions act, 1959, the missions act, it states, nothing contained in this act shall operate to confirm United States nationality, nor determining nationality heretofore lawfully acquired or restored nationality heretofore lost under any law of the United States or under any treaty in which the United States is was a party of. So what they say, you are still they say them. Huh? Because they have to be truthful. They cannot lie. Because they they, they, they I mean we see them lying, but the federal government said, no, we said that. There are plenty of cases where the federal government, yeah, we remember that. But the state is only in the land or that's what we know it's here. Yeah, so but for you to know and understand who you are, even in the state, state of that, they never changed who, well, who we are. We stood a Kamakamaole. They said it right there. They didn't have the power. Hawaiian Amnesty does not operate to confer U.S. nationality of Hawaiian nationals. Hawaii, the Hawaiian Amnesty Act does, does not terminate Hawaiian nationality lawfully acquired under the Hawaiian Kingdom. The Hawaii Admission Act does not restore nationality lost under any law of the United States. So we still are those people. Do not let them call you me. I'm sorry, I said I wouldn't put that on you, but you know what I mean? Up to you. I mean, I'm not going to say it. You know, let's gone through a constitutional website, referendum, right? apology bill. Hawaiian National did not have to see remakers under the court terming national be lawfully acquired, granted under the law of the Hawaiian Kingdom. So if you're in doubt of who you are, see what the federal government says. Public law 103, 150. See all these guys? They represent every every constituent in the state of Hawaii in 1993. So they signed, they have the power of attorney. Especially this person right here, you don't know who it is. His name is Bill Clinton, he plays a saxophone and many other things. This is not All these people, they all state representatives. They all, they all representatives from the state of Hawaii. They, they went and signed this bill. So the things they say, oh, they don't mean nothing. So I don't know who all these guys do. Oh, it's like, come on. Yeah, it's just, you know what I mean? Look, rather than they don't want you know, to like, they write them all over. It's right there, it tells you. I have nothing, I mean, I know nothing to do because it's already there. You know, so for me, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of have my presentation is so hopefully I was, you know, I mean that, that is the biggest gist of my my um, my is who are you? Doesn't matter. All it matters to them enough for the United States to make declarations, to make clarifications, definitions. If it's important enough for them to, be, to declare certain things, why is it important for us to define who we are? We, if we want to go get our lands, the native Hawaiian cannot get the land of Kanaka Maori. And I can prove to you, I, I've been arrested a couple of times. Because I go, I go into places, or I've been checking many times to be arrested. So I'm an advocate for Idi Kupuna. This shirt I hold in front of you is actually a picture of my Kupuna. When we did the Kapuni on Maui the first year, and I marched into a place called Wahe Park, and I did. This image was taken uh, by a young photographer, a friend of mine, and there's a real picture. And on that picture, it shows this face. It came, it was the torch I was carrying. So in that picture, if I can be able to share it, if you go to my um, 
Facebook page, you can see the pictures there. But they have all these faces. This is so, you can blow them up as big as you like, it doesn't change. And in this, get a couple of them, and then on the bottom, get smaller faces. Oh, is that going to trip? Look at her. And she was just leaving the park. But so I carry my kupuna. So I'm an advocate for eating kupuna. I fight in the sand dunes of Maui, which is now taken away. Uh, but I, I fight for the kupuna because of the kingdom laws that are there. In the 1860 law that protect the kupuna to be, to be kept where they are. We legislated that in the kingdom of 1860. Our, all the desecrations actually is, is illegal because they already have a law that protected them. But as Native Hawaiians, we cannot protect them. As Kanaka Maoli, when I walk upon the land, I call myself Kanaka Maoli. When I go into meetings, I tell them, I am a Kanaka Maoli, do not call me a Native Hawaiian. Because you're taking away the rights that are given by my kupuna. My kupuna. This is my kupuna. They come to me because I have a key. Whether you believe me or not, does not matter to me. It matters only to what my kupuna think. And I share the essence of them. The mana that they give. That's what I mean. Come here. It's the feeling that they have of belonging. We belong here. We the Kiki Okaina. You kick it today, you may not understand all that I say. But now I give that fully armor to you. Find out who you are. Find out what you're supposed to do. So, mahalo, thank you. So I'm not here.
Oahu, but is now playing solo. And this is Poki. If you went to his session, um, he spoke about literacy um, and Hawaiian language. I think it blew some people's minds. So, mahalo Poki for being with us today. Rock on. Yeah. 
was waking up with a knock on the door from a friend. He said the brother is gone, he's gone for good. I didn't know that he would. Like the early eve, he was a brave young man, but I didn't get to talk to the man. Like the early he was a brave young man, but I didn't get to talk to the man. Then the brothers and sisters sang along till everybody knew that song. Ooh, I'm okay, I got I not, I got for no. Your fantasy, oh, 
dying blood, set yourself free. Sing a song of sovereignty. Sweet is the song sung in close harmony. Each voice rejoices singing one melody. If we could just come together, listen closely to each other, freedom will come peacefully. Children of the fire clan, taro growers, fishermen, lift your voices, come together, make a stand, control your destiny, live out your fantasy. Hawaiian blood set yourselves free. Sing a song of sovereignty. Children of the fire clan, taro growers, fishermen. Lift your voices, come together, make a stand. Control your destiny, live out your fantasy. Hawaiian blood set yourselves free. You sing a song of sovereignty. I had to sing that song like a thousand billion times, so I stopped crying while I sing it. You know? <laughs> that song is heavy. <laughs>
This next, this next melee. I wrote this melee to stress the importance of more cool home. Yeah. Ina le pa ka mo o ku o ho o vai la ka ko. E ko wai mea, mahalo nui loa, ya o ko, ka ai mai au e hoho mea mea ma nei ma kei a la nani. O vau no o poki i, o kei a ka u mele hope, e hime nia i kei a la. Alai la, mahalo nui ya o ko.
so we establish the feeling of
Ah, não, 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 That's what happens when you uh, front load all the killer songs back. <laughs> Gotta look for something, hopefully. <laughs> Say hey. 
All right, as we transition to our next band, um, I want to put out a, a challenge. If you are in a Kanu shirt and you see a different colored shirt from Malamahonua or from Alokehau or from Kobaikini, I need you guys to start to mix up, talk to each other, find a new friend, uh, come out of wherever you're hiding in the corner. All right, and we're all going to reconvene. We're all going to come onto this part of the stage or uh, at the dance floor at some point when our next band comes on, all right? So get to know somebody, learn their name, ask them what's their favorite uh, song, and get, get ready to dance with them. All right, we got this. If you can introduce a new person that you met from a different school on the mic, I got a high Hawaii for you. Any takers? Any takers? A new friend, hi Hawaii, new friend. That's a, I mean, she, she, went, she graduated from Palo Kumana. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go see Kumu Trevor. Now you gotta introduce on, on mic though. All right, Auntie Koilo, who do you got? I have Hiyaka, my friend over here. What? Mahalo, mahalo. You can get your high Hawaii from uh, Kumu Trevor. All right, so I'm going to introduce Ihilani. We want to mahalo uh, Mana Mele, who always supports us, not only Kanoka Aina, but all of our charter schools and the different programs that they do. Um, so I'm going to turn the mic over to Ihilani. Mahalo. How's it ko? Aloha and how oli la kuokoa. So blessed to share this beautiful holiday and our beautiful kaiaina. Um, I'm Kumu Ihilani from the east side of Oahu as well as Hawaii. And I work with Mana Maoli. We're a Hawaiian nonprofit that brings uh, many of you might be familiar with some of our music videos. Anybody checked out any of our music videos? We had Hawaii 78, Island Style OEVA, <laughs> and Jam for Mauna Kea, Hawaii. The Haumana in these videos. Were any of you in the videos? Yeah, no? Well, the Haumana in these videos were really proud to be a part of winning these Hoku Awards for Music Video of the Year and over 36 million views across these four videos. If you haven't seen them yet, go check them out. Uh, Mana Maoli is on YouTube and we feature some of you in some of our feature videos. All right guys, so Mana Maoli also started one of your sister charter schools, Halau Kumana, also a sailing canoe program and the Mana Mele Project which works with 21 schools across three islands. Eight, eight of which are represented here today. Oh, right on Hawaii. Um, so if any of you are interested, we do have internship opportunities for you, Aropio, uh, in audio and video production, social media, and we also do Kanipila's jam sessions. So, if you want to get invited to any of these things, we'll be passing out clipboards with sign-up sheets, but who's ready for some music? I said, who's ready for some music? Next up, truly living legends, the pioneers of Na Mele Paleo Leo or Hawaiian hip-hop. 
the first and also most well-known group to blend hip-hop with Hawaiian language in diverse musical styles. Their approach has been described as raw, honest, and assertively Hawaiian. They have supported many Mauna Mauli and Hawaiian charter school events over the last 20 years and featured in some of our videos as well. Their music has been a driving force in the Hawaiian sovereignty movement and Hawaiian language movement, inspiring many since the early 90s to get involved and be a part of the solution. One original member, Ke'ala Kava'au Pau Jr., or King Don Juan, passed suddenly a few years ago, but he lives on in their music today. We are blessed to have these legends, the original vocalist Shane Dino and Caleb Richards in the house with us today, as well as their newest member, Makana. Let's give it up for Sudden Rush! We're just gonna do a little white check. It's been a while since we've been in God's country. Young generation, come pick my shop, 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 young generation, come pick
performing that we did it earlier in Hilo, but it was nothing like this. Nothing like this. You guys bring the vibe. Can you feel it? I can feel it. I can certainly feel it up here. The mana. Oh. Next time we're going to do another new one. I got it right the first time. This song is called What We Are. As a way to say who's proud. The song is called Proud. Thank you. I'm proud. As we speak, we can get the name of the song. We are all proud, eh? 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 Oh, 
Oh my God, I'm proud for you. <laughs> Yeah, we want to give a big shout out to uh, two very important people today. We want to acknowledge them. Uh, Anake Ku and Uncle Nale Kakalao having the vision. Mahalo Anui Ya Olua Man, we've been doing this for over 20. 20? I'm going to be 50 years old. Shane's uh, going to be. I only turned. Shane's going to be 60. Has anybody seen Night Marchers? So how do you know? Huh? I heard there's like trails over here, huh? Night Marchers trails over here, huh? Right there with Pio. Well, you guys want to hear a song, Night Marchers? Don't get scared now. And we also want to, we also want to recognize Ke'e Hawaii. And, uh, and most importantly, we want to thank our host today. Kamu Okainam, Hale Yao Kofa Kahia Paul for having us on Laku Okoa. Eo! 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 Oya no! Are you guys scared? Oh man! Oh, he not scared! Oh yeah? Let's hit him with the name watcher! Oh
You guys ready? So we get, we get Alika, Kalate, and CJ. They will join us on this man. You guys want to go? Oh, and they're here. Oh, hey. Come on, Brian. Play, play, you need
one more time for Sunrise. We want to say mahalo nui to your Pokumu for helping us to make this happen today. And we want to mahalo again at Tiku and Uncle Nale Kahakalao. And last but not least, we want to mahalo you, our Haumana and Kumu, for partying with us today and celebrating La Kuoko on the right way. So heads up. I know Uncle's been saying already, but they just went drop a whole album today, guys, y'all. Yeah? Celebrating La Cool Class. So no forget to check them out. Uh, follow them on Instagram and Facebook. Also, follow Mana Mauli on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. You can catch highlights from today. Aloha, ahui ho. Okay, so it is 2.06. School gets out at 3 o'clock. Um, we are going to wrap up this section, or at least um, we are all going to come back together. One, There's a couple things we want to do. We want to take a picture of everyone up by this stage. And then we also are going to kind of close this section. Um, and then whatever time is left, we're going to let the kumu... You can decide what you want to do with your keiki, uh, the young ones at least. And then if you are in middle school and high school, we want you to be here. We want you to be um, conversating with each other, making new friends. Uh, I, I know there's uh, basketball, there's roping, there's makiki games. There's all kinds of stuff that we can do um, to get to know each other and have a little fun before we close. Check with your kumu though when you are going back to your class and when you're doing all that. So if we get everybody out here for a group picture, um, right after we sing this song.
Tonight, because we went and released our album, but 